Hello, and welcome to another installment of The Weird Chronicles. Each episode, we bring you tales of action and adventure from Malifaux and the other side. The Guild has always had a troubled relationship with the Miners and Steamfitters Union. Mercenaries and hired guns wage a proxy war on behalf of these two powerful organizations. In today's story, the events that unfold at a lavish party could change the balance of power in Malifaux forever. I hope you enjoy the Hollow Marsh Gala. The Hollow Marsh Gala by Nicholas Volker You are listening to KMAL 417.2 MHz on your wireless dial. I am Frederick Grogstein, ether casting live from the Hollow Marsh pumping station, the site of tonight's gala event. Malifaux and Earthside Elite will gather here in mere moments to dedicate this new facility. Tonight we will hear from several speakers, including the Governor General himself. Many expect he will lord the new facility for opening up some 40 square kilometers of previously unminable land and eliminating the flooding hazard at a half dozen currently operating sites. It is also expected that the Governor General will publicly recognize the architect of the Hollow Marsh facility, Dr. Victor Ramos. Ramos has enjoyed a huge surge of popularity with the labor class for his efforts to increase miners' safety. Use of his mechanical canary at the Gamma 6 site has seen the casualty rate there fall 70%. For his efforts, he has recently been re-elected as president of the Miners and Steamfitters Union, and his revolutionary ideas have done much to remove the dead man walking stigma of the miners' profession. Ah, I'm uncertain if you can hear, but behind me the Hollister's Automata Orchestra has begun to warm up. The facility's observation deck has been richly decorated for tonight's event. It enjoys a pleasant view across the glassy outflow lagoon. Later, this deck will see Malifaux's social elite, along with Earthside's most influential soulstone speculators, dancing and celebrating. Union representatives will share drink with guild officials, coming together with the best interests of Malifaux's miners in mind. Oh, the first of the guests are arriving. Quite a treat. Madame Malifaux, Neo Art Nouveau Impressionist and her husband, have just arrived. She is breathtaking in her Dame Guinevere gown. The signal faded, as often happens as a result of the volatile Malifaux weather. Beneath the buzzing radio, the two employees of Mademoiselle Coco's boutique sat huddled together. The two women shivered in each other's arms and stared fearfully at the barred door nearby. From their hiding spot in the stockroom of the boutique, they could hear movement in the showroom beyond. The radio's buzzing intensified, and Frederick's voice was reduced to unintelligible clicks. With the sudden buzz came a sudden heavy footfall outside. The women gasped as another stomp shook the lights in their fixtures. The booming footsteps approached, and each step the giant made caused the lights to flicker and the door to rattle in its frame. The women held their breath, certain that the monster outside the door had become aware of their presence. There was silence. Nothing moved. The only clue that time had not stopped completely was the rapidly drumming heartbeats of the two terrified women. The silence was short-lived and broken by a sudden boom. The door split down the middle and the women cried out, their lungs bursting with a shrill scream. That scream persisted in a horrible chorus as the door was shook again and again by repeated strikes. The timber that barred the door was unable to withstand the violence, bowing and cracking. Light from beyond the door filtered through the splintered wood, and horrible iron talons tore away the ruined planks. In the space between the broken slats, the maddened face of a young woman appeared. Her grin was wide and toothy as a Cheshire cat. Her eyes were like empty pools, completely dilated with her obvious insanity. Her breath beat quickly in her chest, escaping from her lips in a mad laugh with each sharp exhale. Just as soon as a screaming woman caught sight of those crazy eyes, a giant revolver replaced her face. The girl's finger twitched, and the gun lurched with an ear-splitting bang. 
She howled with mad glee and quickly emptied her revolver of its rounds, the weapon firing wildly into the stockroom. Empty, her finger continued to click the trigger, her appetite for violence unsatisfied by just six bullets. The two women turned to look at each other, certain that they must be ghosts. Somehow, though, they had been spared, and their screams transitioned abruptly into silent shock. The radio above them, however, did not survive the encounter, its ruined transistors scattered throughout the room. The women lifted their eyes to look at the girl who leaned through the wrecked door. She blinked and glanced down at them, as if just realising they were there. The girl's breathing had slowed, recovering from her fit of madness. She whispered, That buzzing was driving me crazy. The woman did not seem comforted by this explanation. The girl bent down and picked up a pair of pumps she had dropped by her feet. Looking at the women again, she asked casually, Can I get the bag that goes with these shoes? Behind her came the low and gruff sound of an elderly gentleman's voice. Alice, come along. We're going to be late to the gala. Alice frowned slightly and called out, Yes, Leviticus, just a moment. She kicked down what remained of the door and waved hello to the clerks with her mechanical arm. The arm didn't seem well maintained, and at the gesture it gave an eerie squeaking sound that somehow suggested its desire for something more sanguine than oil. Knocking over a few boxes, Alice found the bag she wanted and hurried back out into the showroom where her escort was patiently waiting. She had selected one of Mademoiselle Coco's most extravagant gowns. It was a dark, ruddy colour that contrasted sharply with the girl's pale skin and had semi-precious stones sewn into the lacy hem. Leviticus thought it must be fate that such a sophisticated gown was found in this tiny backwater boutique, and one that fit her slender adolescent figure. He had to admit to himself that the gown had its charm, and what he thought was a fool's errand had turned up a surprising treasure. Alice made note of the look on Leviticus's face as he measured her up in the gown, and she smiled a crooked smile. She pinched his arm and whispered, Come along, we are going to be late to the gala. There is a train that passes west out of Malifaux and into the foothills. It makes the trip four times a day, once for the start of each of the two miners' twelve-hour shifts, another at mid-morning and once more at mid-afternoon. For workers travelling to more distant sites, Wagons are used to reach those remote locations. For Leviticus and Alice, however, their benefactor had arranged other transportation. The driver of their coach did not seem affected by the sound of gun blasts heard previously, and maintained a quiet and professional demeanour as he opened the carriage door. He addressed them both as Lord and Lady, even offering Alice a hand to climb inside. He was thankful that he was spared the touch of her mechanical hand, but his face did not betray his relief in that small comfort. The driver knew who his clients were, contract murderers. Rusty Alice's erratic demeanour had earned a modest reputation in Malifaux, and some saloon rumours purported that her mechanical arm had a mind and temperament all of its own. Some of the more creative stories even have Alice arguing with her arm at times. As deadly as Alice might be, however, hired guns are twelve for ten cents in Malifaux. It is Leviticus's skills that put the pair into a whole other pay scale. Men cannot count on death to save them from him. To pass the time on the journey, Alice toyed with her revolver, turning out the cylinder of her weapon and clapping it closed over and over. With each click of the closing cylinder, Leviticus gave her an annoyed glance, but the girl didn't seem to get the message. Reaching over, he trapped her hand against the weapon with his own. Stop that! Put that away! Will that even fit in the bag you picked out? Alice responded with a frown, but demonstrated the bag's utility by stuffing her oversized revolver into it. Inside was a mess of rounds she'd poured into it. Now I want you to remember to be calm. I would prefer not to have any collateral casualties tonight. We're only after one mark. Leviticus narrowed his brow. And remember not to shoot him in the head. Alice grinned at that last warning and nodded her head. Right, of course, no headshots. Also, I want you to remember your manners tonight. 
there will be many influential people at this gala. If we don't maintain a courtly presence, we'll stick out and we may alert our mark. Understand. Alice nodded again. I know, Leviticus. I've been reading that book you gave me, A Young Woman's Reader. The girl turned to look out the window of the coach. The hollow marsh pumping station rose into view. Oh, look! I didn't realise it'd be such a lovely place. For a facility with such a humble purpose as pumping water out of mines, the hollow marsh pumping station was a grandiose monument to modern engineering. Each of the six giant steam engines was equipped with towering smokestacks and steam vents. Each of the stacks were adorned by six statuesque saints, perched atop curling clouds, each attributed with a different virtue, and each watching over the facility from above. Beneath them were the enormous pump wheels, which then stood still, but would soon drive the great pistons that would pump water from distant mines. These wheels were arrayed in a half-circle around the observation deck, from which workers would be able to monitor the workings of the engines below. Opposite the wheels, across the deck, was the lagoon. The waters here were peaceful and serene, but would churn when the pumps were activated and poured out into it. The Hollow Marsh facility would also serve as the new offices of the Miners and Steamfitters Union and employ a dozen labourers itself. Already, several ancillary buildings had been constructed nearby to serve the workforce here, a trading post, tavern, and ubiquitous brothel. These were the first of many and represented the seed of a town that would grow in service of this facility. The coach driver drew at the reins of his horse and the coach rolled to a stop. Leviticus exited and turned to help Alice from the carriage. A man in a tuxedo approached them and asked for their invitation, which Leviticus produced from inside his jacket. The gentleman turned and read from the card, announcing the couple. Introducing Professor Trelway of the New Amsterdam Academy of Metallurgists and his daughter Linda Trelway, chapter member of Kappa Delta. Alice tugged lightly on Leviticus's sleeve and grinned up at him, whispering softly, Daughter, is it? Leviticus didn't look amused and responded, Remember your reader, Linda. The two ascended the long staircase that led up to the observation deck. It was already crowded with debutantes and dignitaries, each chatting with another while the tightly buttoned waitstaff toured the crowd with plates of appetizers and glasses of champagne held aloft. To a man situated high above the crowd, they looked like ants stirring in their nest. Poised upon St. Genevieve's head, atop one of the station's smokestacks, an assassin crouched. His black attire hid him from their sight, but his looking-glass allowed him to pick out his quarry from the crowd. His eye focused on the platform erected on the lagoon side of the observation deck, the platform where the gala VIPs sat and discussed what must be very important matters. He recognised the Governor-General and a Guild Deputy at that table, and he recognised Ramos and his associate, the Vice President of the Labour Union, a man called Duncan McSweeney. The assassin put aside his looking-glass and began to unpack his tools. His was a weapon several weeks in the making, designed particularly for this job. Four iron tubes were loaded with four paper and gunpowder rockets, devices similar to fireworks that might be employed for celebration, these were designed with lethal intent and deadly payloads. A trigger mechanism on the underside of the tubes articulated a series of flint and steel devices connected to each of the rocket's fuses so that they might be fired individually. Atop the iron tubes, the assassin mounted his looking glass and sighted down the length of it, focusing on Ramos again. While the assassin had worked, Ramos had been delivering his speech, the man was known for fiery and moving rhetoric. He was as skilful with words as he was with turbine and cog. His powerful oratory worked its magic on the gathered socialites tonight, and on Alice in particular. Hugging close to Leviticus's side, she gazed up at the man at the podium. The particular items he spoke of, miners' rights, the responsibility of industry, these things didn't mean much to Alice. But she admired the obvious passion that possessed Ramos, such passion is an admirable and attractive quality. Ramos spoke, and without aid of any artificial device, his voice was clearly and unmistakably heard by all men and women present. 
This facility represents our triumph over one of Malifaux's demons. Never again will a flooded shaft make one of Malifaux's wives a widow. Our men will no longer fear the temperamental Malifaux sky and its threat of rain. Each of these men deserves nothing less than to return to their wives and children each night and live to be old men. I will not rest until that simple ideal is guaranteed to each man who mines in Malifaux. You, who will return Earthside in the morning, take my words with you. The greatest resource of Malifaux is not its soul stone, but the strength and spirit of its people. Immediately at the conclusion of Ramos's speech, the Hollister's Automata Orchestra jumped into song. Emboldened by Ramos's oratory, the debutantes paired off with their escorts and began the night of drinking and dancing. They would return home and tell of a magical night in exotic Malifaux and of the fiery Ramos who could enchant the devil himself. As Ramos came down from the platform, Alice broke from Leviticus's side. The old man reached out for her and even gave chase after her, but mishandling his cane, he missed the chance to catch her. She rushed to the foot of the platform, her deep red gown sweeping around her feet. Alice remembered the passages from a young woman's reader that dealt with this particular situation. Though the reader cautioned that such forward actions were only proper in a small handful of situations, Alice could clearly visualise the cartoon girl in its pages performing her curtsy and stating coyly, It is a night made for dancing, is it not? Ramos stopped short on that final stare, clearly given pause by the girl's sudden appearance. However, the cogs of propriety had already begun to spin and he was motivated by their weighty turn to answer in kind, Indeed it is, miss. Perhaps you will grant me the enviable privilege of a dance. Alice only answered with a curtsy and took Ramos's outstretched hand. He drew her into his arms and the two of them joined the swirling procession of dancers as they revolved around the observation deck like gears in a grand machine. Though Grey had crept into Ramos's hair, Alice was surprised at the strength in Ramos's arms and the stately grace in his movements. The song of the mechanical orchestra faded from its boisterous celebratory notes into a gentle waltz. All around, dancers drew their partners closer and Alice quickly found herself in Ramos's embrace. Ramos wasn't quite as enchanted. Her mechanical hand seemed to take the opportunity to act of its own accord, as its owner was distracted by her first dance. Her iron talons walked up along his shoulder toward his neck, and several times throughout the song, Ramos had to lift his hand from Alice's waist to replace her errant hand on his arm. The odd demeanour of his dancing partner and the activities of her autonomous hand inspired a cautious curiosity in Ramos that prevented him from sharing Alice's starry-eyed experience. Leviticus was livid. His narrowed eyes marked the placement of Ramos's hand on Alice's body and the scandalous distance between them. His teeth ground against each other and every muscle in his body wound tight with anger. Jealousy took hold of him and it took every ounce of his strength to resist that demon's whispers. Instead, he stood still, waiting for the ending of the song so that they might part and he could take her to his side again. The final notes of the song did come, and with them Alice woke from her dreaming. Her iron hand once again answered her command, and she curled her fingers into the lapel of Ramos's suit. Despite Ramos's strength, he couldn't fight the pull of that mechanical arm. She pulled him down and rose up on her toes to kiss him. All around, the guests gasped at what they saw and whispered amongst themselves, asking questions. Who is that girl? Who is Ramos kissing? Isn't she a bit young for him? Leviticus's rage could not abide this trespass, and he rushed toward the two of them, calling out with some garbled curse. His cane struck the tiled floor as he pushed against one of the guests, and the old man spilled out onto the floor. The crowd parted, forming a circle around the three of them. There was gasping and pointing and more whispers as the crowd looked upon the spectacle before them. And it was then that the assassin struck. With a pull of his trigger, there was a sudden flare as his rocket was loosed. The projectile made a loud whistling sound as it sped down toward the crowd. None of the guests seemed to hear it, 
all of them too preoccupied with the scene unfolding before them. No one seemed to notice, except for one. With swift motion, Alice drew her revolver from her handbag and pointed it up at the sky. The shocked crowd quickly turned into a frightened crowd at the sudden appearance of the weapon, and several screams sounded out. Alice's eyes took on that maddened gleam, and her smile widened into that terrible, toothy grin. There you are. I've been waiting for you. Her revolver barked, and the descending projectile exploded overhead. Its payload of tiny needles rained over the crowd, but because of Alice's shot, Ramos, Leviticus, and she were spared. Wherever a needle struck, the victim's wound bubbled up with sickly green pus, and it was quickly apparent that the quills were poisoned. Though the wounds might appear terrible, few of the guests were in any real danger. Those visitors staying at the Governor-General's mansion had already received the antidote to the poison. Only those individuals representing the Union, those people who had not already supped with the Governor, had anything to worry about. In the morning it would appear as if some terrorist had struck, and it would be fine justification to increase security at the pumping station, killed security. Those that survived would praise the governor's doctor for the miracles he performed. With three quick flares, the assassin's three remaining rockets leapt down at the crowd. Alice fired into the sky again, but this time her target was the man, not his munitions. The sound of her rounds ricocheting off the smokestack was barely audible over the sound of the screaming crowd. Ramos stepped down and slung an arm beneath Leviticus's shoulder, hauling him to his feet. Together they dove under the VIP platform for cover. The platform shielded the two men from the salvo of rockets, and when the explosions had passed, Leviticus pulled himself out from under it and called after his associate. Don't shoot him in the head! Overhead, there was another flare, but this wasn't a weapon. Strapped to the assassin's back was another rocket, and this one carried him up off the smokestack and out toward the east, in the direction of Ridley Station. Alice raced after him and reached into her handbag, pulling out a handful of rounds. She mashed her fistful of ammunition against the cylinder of her weapon, and three of the chambers were filled, the rest of the rounds spilling out onto the ground. She lifted her weapon and fired wildly. With the devil's own luck, one of those rounds struck true, and the assassin's rocket was hit. The ruined missile spun him in the air, and then, with a sputter, sent him hurtling to the ground like a meteor. A fire rose from the brush, marking the crash site. Alice, after kicking off her pumps and fueled by her lust for violence, quickly arrived. She swept the area with her revolver, firing indiscriminately into the shadows cast by the fire before the weapon was knocked from her grasp by an attack from her side. She couldn't see the man, his image cast in silhouette by the light of the fire. But he wielded a polished blade that shone brightly with that same light. He lashed out at her with that sword, cutting a wide swath in her skirts, and again sparks flying as it struck her false limb. The man looked at Alice, and he did not see fear in those wide eyes. He saw the fire burn in them, and he saw a certain madness there. It was the kind of madness that knew no reason, no fear or death. It was the kind of madness that knows only the object of its obsession, knows only the murder it yearns to make. Looking into her eyes, the assassin felt an unfamiliar fear grip him, and felt Alice begin to press the attack. The gears of her mechanical arm groaned in their rusty orbits, squealing as she lashed out again and again. Her cruel talons raked at his flesh and sought his throat. His sword caught in her fingers, and with the close of her fist, the blade snapped. With another quick motion, her fingers swept across his neck, tearing out his throat. It is a merciful thing that his cries and his life were silenced. Alice's hunger was not sated by that brief melee, and in the flickering light of brushfire, she knelt beside him and drew from his body what satisfaction she could. When Ramos and Leviticus finally caught up to her, there was very little left of the man but gore. Alice's pale skin was bathed in crimson red to match her gown, thick on her as if she'd swam in it. I see you've remembered one lesson tonight, Leviticus said coldly as he reached down to pick up the assassin's head, which was still intact. He held it up, 
his fingers curled into the dead man's hair. Do your work on it, Leviticus. We will meet like planned, Ramos said. Take the carriage. Deputies will be here any moment. Leviticus nodded his head. Alice stood and backed away from the corpse. The fire had spread and moved to engulf her plaything. Wiping the blood from her face, she attempted a smile at her escort. He didn't seem pleased. Leviticus opened the door and let his benefactor into his lap. All about the chamber was collected a curious collection of devices, each one sparked or spun in its own unique way, and arcs of lightning flashed through a network of electrodes arrayed overhead. The walls were filled with banks of heavy switches that operated the arcane equipment. In the centre of the workspace, Ramos recognised the assassin's head mounted on a pike. Cables poured out of his severed neck and wound across the floor to a control panel. I've already taken the liberty of performing an initial interrogation. As you suspected, he was hired by the Governor-General. Leviticus explained. Where is Alice? Ramos asked in response. Leviticus narrowed his eyes. I've sent her on an errand. Why do you ask? That girl is a devil. If I ever meet her again, it will be too soon. Take care with her, Leviticus. I'll keep that in mind. Leviticus threw one of the great switches, and a buzz of electricity sounded, but with little other effect. Ask your questions. Ramos drew up a seat and sat across from the disembodied head. Leaning in close, he gazed curiously at what was left of the man who tried to kill him the night before. What did the Governor-General hope to achieve by killing me? In immediate response, a bellows supplied wind to the dead man's voice. His mouth jerked with uncertain reanimation. To gain control of the Union. That's impossible. The Union would live on. They would elect another of their kind. Ramos pressed. Your man, McSweeney. The corpse voice breathed quietly. Both living men listened closely. He's a guild man. Ramos lifted his hand and motioned to Leviticus to switch off the device. He turned in his chair and faced the other man. So, do you want the contract? McSweeney's life. I was hoping for something a bit more sophisticated than murder for our next job. But I suppose it can't be helped, Leviticus replied. The two of them discussed business for a while longer, and coins traded hands as a new contract was forged. Leviticus watched as Ramos left his lap, and the image of him kissing Alice flashed into his memory. His brow furled and his distaste for the man intensified. In the morning, he decided... He would inquire with the guild fixer about any available work. <laughs>